It is so good to see everyone here today. And so we will ask Elder Velma to open this session in prayer. Let us pray. Padre y Madre que estás en los cielos, santificado es tu nombre. Father, Mother, God, who art in heaven, hallowed is your name. We are so thankful, O oh God, for this day, for this morning, for this evening. We are so thankful for these uh, theologies from the margins that gives us different perspectives and things to ponder and think upon and put into action. And we welcome with open hearts uh, today, Professor Kakai, and we ask you to be with uh, with uh, with her this morning and that she may open more eyes and more minds for the rest of us. And we thank you for this uh, benefit of technology even with its jagged edges, we are meeting here from all over the world, and we are so grateful. And all the saints that are supposed to be here are here. And Lord, we just ask your blessing upon this time together. May it be all to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder Velma. Well, it is such an honor for me to introduce today's lecturer, we have Professor Kakai Pamaran, who serves as the Executive Assistant to the President and Director for Communications at Union Theological Seminary in the Philippines. She teaches courses in New Testament studies and educational psychology. She is the convener of the seminary's Center for Gender and Sexuality. Professor Pamaran serves as lecturer and resource speaker for the National Council of Churches in the Philippines in its summer internship program, its HIV AIDS education program, and its gender justice seminars. She also serves as a resource, resource person for various programs of the Council for World Mission, the World Communion of Reformed Churches, and the World Council of Churches. She is part of the curriculum writing team of the uh, CWN's Theological Education for an Economy of Life Offering. Kakai has a BS in Psychology from Silliman University, a Master of Divinity, and a Master of Theology in New Testament Criticism and Historical Jesus Research from Union Theological Seminary, Philippines. Kakai was a former pastor of the Metropolitan Community Church, Quezon City, and is a member and former co-chair of the board of the South Africa-based organization, the Global Interfaith Network for People of All Sexualities, Sexual Orientations, Gender Identity, and Expressions. Let's give a warm welcome to Professor Kakai today. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that uh, generous introduction, although a quick life update. Um, as of July 16, I think was it? As of July 16, I no longer serve as EA to the president because my term is co-terminus and we just changed presidents. So <laughs> right now we are uh, in the middle of, well, toward the end of um, uh, transitioning uh, to the new uh, administration, the new leadership. So now I have more time to um, hopefully read um, and do all sorts of stuff. So uh, good evening from, from my side of the world. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, wait, sorry. Let me just adjust my view. Yeah, okay. Um, my name is Takai. Uh, uh, and uh, I am glad to be here. And I realized I was the last speaker. Uh, uh, and so I am not sure if I am, uh, it's, a very, it's a good idea to put me as the last speaker, but it's okay. Uh, we can uh, <laughs> continue to engage uh, the work and the paper that I will be presenting to you today. It is, uh, I'm hoping it's, it's going to be a 30 minute presentation so we can have uh, time, more time for discussion later. Uh, thank you so much for waking up early. Uh, to to be in this call, um, I I really appreciate um, the energy that emanates no, from 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 the screen. So I am going to uh, share my slides. Oh, uh, can I be allowed to share my screen? Sorry, I didn't set this up later or earlier on. Uh,
Sorry. No, sorry. One second. I was letting someone sure. in. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So I'm going to just go ahead and start. I don't really need to. I need my slides immediately. Um, so it should work now. OK, thank you. Um, we began this series. Uh, the Council of Elders had, had convened this series to answer one question, and that is, where has theology been a hindrance for people on the margins, and where does it liberate? And I am hoping that this question will continue to linger and our churches will continue to engage this and the many answers that have been provided so far um, from different locations both as a spiritual practice and as a means to inform our church or denominational affairs theology hindrance for people on the margins and liberate those three words Osorial intent aside, and I recognize that my starting point of the discourse is semantics, my answer to our question lies in the formulation of the question itself. Theology, quote and unquote, in the singular, automatically hinders and almost instantaneously defines and informs marginality, where liberation and indeed liberative and prophetic imaginings are hindered by the use of the singular. Languages are signs, words are signs. As interpreters of scripture, we all engage the text as signs. The Christian writes theology in the lower case, which tells me that this word is used to describe an act, to theologize or to do God talk, as in theologizing, rather than a theology, the big D, as a set of prescriptions and directives. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes? Okay. Certainly the process of doing theology is a process of privileging experience in our God talk, experiences in our God talk. Theology is a hindrance to liberation and emancipation of peoples when it privileges the singular, the powerful, the absolute. When in our God talk, we do not talk about the oppressions, marginalizations, and human sufferings of people, it will be um, marginalizing um, and it, uh, it will be not liberating. As queer people of the metropolitan community churches, witnessing from the underside and professing the plurality, diversity, multiplicity of truths of the whole of creation in the cosmos, as interpreters of signs, we know, as experienced by our very bodies and our histories, just how dangerous the privileging of a singular absolute truth is. The invitation tonight, or today for some of you, is the interrogation of our own semiotic meanings and the truths that we privilege so that we can expand our own meanings, meaning makings, and truth tellings. In my context, to do theologies that liberate, I must privilege the human experience of oppression, marginalization, and suffering. I am Kakai. And like the second speaker in this series named Revelation, who's also in this call, I live in an archipelago of 7,107 islands. 7,107 islands and 3,000 less than Indonesia. The numbers are highly debatable because the number changes temporarily depending on the tide. Uh, and I think more permanently, permanently now in the midst of the climate crisis, as we have island neighbors whose lands are literally sinking, or maybe they're not really sinking, uh, the, the water levels are rising. Not semantics. <laughs> we are the only professing Christian nation in Southeast Asia, as in literally we have an official state religion, and it is Christianity. We are also among the most corrupt countries in the world, 
one of the most dangerous places for media practitioners, one of the most deadly countries for farmers and laborers. Our former President Duterte has racked up a debt that surpassed the grand total of all the debts incurred by all the other presidents before him. The borrowing, of course, um, was for COVID. But the COVID response has been a difficult uphill climb. Vaccination drives picked up very late into the pandemic. This poor COVID response has eclipsed his record of the previous president. The number of drug-related killings that has numbered up to 20,000 deaths since he came into power. All these deaths were carried out mostly by the police force. And we swore in a new president about a year ago of the same stock and storyline, the son of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos, who has yet to prove his, polit prove his political competency. He ran his campaign almost solely on two-minute TikTok videos. YouTube video content of his version of history amplified by various online media, uh, media personalities, TV directors, actors who rallied and hyped up the Filipino people. And he won. This photo here of my friend who was an LGBT activist who in 2020 at the height of the pandemic joined the peaceful pride protest as soon as the military lockdown was partially lifted to call the government into a more proactive and decisive COVID response. This was their response. My friend and 19 others were arrested, although <clears throat> arrests technically must mean that they have violated something, but the Manila City Police could not determine what it was they violated. They were kept in the police station for uh, more than 48 hours. They weren't in jail. They were just kept in an office. I figured in other contexts, this is a major human rights violation. They were eventually released, of course, after the world saw that thing unfold before their very eyes and messages of support for the protesters and condemnation against police brutality started pouring in. Our religious demographic in the Philippines, and this is the most uh, recent statistic I could find from the U.S. State Department of all places in their 2019 Religious Freedom Report, show that 79.5% of the population in the Philippines is Roman Catholic. 9% belong to the mainline Protestant denominations and other Christian groups, including Seventh-day Adventists, the UCC, the Ninth Church of Christ in the Philippines, the United Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church in the Philippines, the Bible Baptist Church, and other Protestant churches, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, and the, the Church of Christ of the Latter-day Saints. This also includes locally established churches such as the Iglesia Ni Cristo, Church of Christ, and the Philippine Independent Church or the Aglipayan uh, Church, etc. Lump that all together, the way we are lumping the Muslim population together, not mindful of the sex within the Islamic faith, and we have sort of a Christian bloc that comprises around 88% of the population, or 89, oh yeah, 88% of the population of our beloved republic. We are pushing 110 million population of the Philippines is 110 million, by the way, more, more people here than Sweden. Um, so 88% is a lot of people, and there are so many of us, that we tend to overrun public spaces, public discourse, and public yeah. life. We marginalize people uh, and our religious discourse, um, even if we did not try, because there's just uh, too many of us and we are not careful with our language among other things. So the question that the MCC elders posted is really a good question to ask here. And I wish uh, the people that need to listen to this lecture series were here because honestly, I actually feel I'm preaching to the choir, uh, <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> As the rest of, um, yeah, uh, MCC and I've been, uh, I was, I started my map about 10 years ago um, in 2013, I think it was, and um, uh, witnessing uh, the work, the life and work and histories of MCC, uh, it's, it's a very refreshing uh, radical church and uh, very different from uh, the demographic that I, I've shown here. 
for context, and I will uh, take less than five minutes to provide this because uh, while this is not uh, the main point, it provides the necessary backdrop uh, to what I wish to share with all of you today. Um, I'm going to do a short history lesson. Uh, Reverend Gaudi, I'm going to uh, send you the paper, so uh, if you miss anything, that's, <laughs> that's fine. As the rest of Christendom remembers 500 years of Reformation in Europe in 2021, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, the separation of these European countries from the Roman Church, we remember the arrival of the Spanish galleons on our shores. So as the Reformation turned 500, we commemorate 500 years of Christianity. Roman Catholicism in the Philippines. The long and short of that story is that um, while Europe was in the middle of this religio-political uh, religio -political war, uh, uh, Game of Thrones vibe, which located and dislocated territorial boundaries in that side of the world, Spain sent expeditions to the Far East. Far, of course, in relation to their geographic location which according to common world history, was an attempt at circumnavigation. Ferdinand Magellan, the commandante of the Spanish fleet, was killed in Mactan, Cebu, by the Chris of the warrior Lapu-Lapu, who led the defense of the tribal shoreline against the perceived threat from the giant ships. Like our neighbor Indonesia, we were once island tribal nations. We were not a singular country. The map that we now have that looks like a cat with a mohawk did not always look like that. We were na later named Philippines after Philip of Asturias or Felipe of Asturias, a Spanish king. And for about two and a half centuries, we as a Spanish colony were under the viceroyalty of the news of New Spain, modern day Mexico. For a while, we were in fact Las Islas Filipinas. Pinas Provincia de Mexico, which is, of course, a story for another time. Eventually, in 1898, after 300 plus plus years, the Spanish entered into an agreement with a then emerging superpower, the United States of America, where Spain relinquished its control over its colonies, including the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Cuba, among others, for a compensation of $20 million. You know this as the Treaty of Paris. This is the amount paid by the United States to the Spanish crown. Also, of course, a story for another time. Nevertheless, and I am in no way trying to simplify a very complicated matter, similar to the genesis of missional stories elsewhere, Christianity, Christianities came to us from Europe and the United States via the sword and the machine gun. Our Protestantism, in fact, is largely mediated through the North American Christian denominational experience. For instance, my seminary, Union Theological Seminary in the Philippines, is an institution established by Americans in 1907. The university where I did my undergraduate study, Silliman University, is an institution established by the Americans in 1901. As a people, as these powers and principalities waged wars and paid for territories, we struggled to even find our earliest historical memory. In fact, if you ask anyone in the Philippines to describe how we were as a people in the olden times, very rarely will you find anyone, someone who can think past 1521. So how then do we find a way to theologize as queer persons of faith in the 21st century in the Philippines? How do we then articulate theologies that liberate? I present um, three answers <laughs> to this question. And my first answer, the standard answer, is turning swords into plowshares. And I will unpack this by using the image of the jeepney. Is everyone familiar with what a jeepney is? No, okay, I have photos, I prepared. <laughs> Our historical Christianization was an imperial project. We're imperial projects. This we have to confront and face head on. The Christian elements such as the Bible or icons such as the Bible was used against our indigenous peoples as a weapon to execute, exterminate, exclude, and marginalize. 
Jeeps into jeepneys is very revelation, actually. And so I'd like to borrow his method for explaining this. Um, are you familiar? Uh, you're familiar with the war jeepneys, right? The general purpose or the GP vehicle or Jeep. It was requested in the 1940s and manufactured by uh, well, Willys and Ford. It is considered as the United States' most important contribution to modern warfare. It is a weapon of mass destruction. This war jeep was among the weapons that, that, that used, uh, the weapons used to kill off the resistance of our people. That, well, that's very, very modern. I didn't have a, a photo of uh, the one with the gun. Now, are you familiar with our jeepney? I asked earlier. Uh, our jeepney kind of looks like that. No, it's not Mercedes-Benz. They just put it there. Um, <laughs> this is our most basic form of public transportation. All cities in the Philippines have jeepneys of all shapes and sizes. Um, of course, this is uh, now a, a, a reconstruction of, uh, of its, uh, of its uh, predecessor or its genesis, right? Um, when you come visit the Philippines, and I hope you do, you must ride one of our jeepneys because um, most places are only acceptable, uh, accessible uh, by jeepney and uh, well, two, so two kinds of public transport, the jeepney and its three-wheeled counterpart, the tricycle. Jeepney came from Willis Jeep or Ford Jeep. After the war, not all war jeeps sailed back to mainland United States. Some of these stayed. So the people disarmed the jeep, they got rid of the machine gun, or probably uh, the soldiers took the machine gun with them, took it apart, reoriented the seat so it can fit more people, and made it into some kind of public transport for the community. After the war, when we were just rising from the ashes, farmers were able to take their produce to the market a little bit faster. For, um, and uh, and people were able to travel to different places using uh, the disarmed jeep. And they all just chip in for petrol, where the person next to you will pass your coins to the driver, a ritual act that exists to this very day. When you come visit and ride the jeepney, that's how it looks like today, um, you just extend your, your hand, kind of like extend your hand like that, um, and you're not issued a passenger ticket, okay? So there's no one to give tickets uh, or whatever. It's just very, very informal. Um, you extend your hand with your money and someone will take it and pass it to the driver. If you pay too much, your change will be passed back to you. If you need to get off the Jeep, you either yell or tap the um, metal handbars uh, with, with a coin. Um, and the driver will find a relatively safe spot. And I say relatively because sometimes the driver will just stop in the middle of the road uh, for you to alight. Uh, if you don't have money, you can ask the jeepney driver for a free ride. And I swore I've done this. Some of them will say yes. The others will say yes angrily. But they will still say yes. <laughs> I once rode a jeepney for free because the driver said that his daughter had passed the teacher's licensure examination. So usually this is a very, um, very community thing. My friends, the inventors of the war GP, the inventors of the war Jeep would have never imagined that the communities it was meant to annihilate took this weapon of mass destruction, disarmed it, deconstructed it, decorated it, and turned it into community transportation. Theologies that privilege the communities that reclaim the jeepney and turned it from a weapon of mass destruction into a means of public transport. Theologies that disarm and deconstruct the imperial theology that brought the GP into our lands in the first place. These theologies are liberating. We abandon the part of the GP that killed us, take it apart, deconstruct it, and reconstruct it to one that we call cheapening for the use of our communities. That's my first point. The second one, again, 
uh, unpacking, turning swords into plowshares, is reclaiming stories and birthing our own myths. MCC is very, very well known for uh, for birthing myths and all these language. And I'm so proud uh, to have been witness to uh, many of these writings. I said earlier that our story of colonization erased most of our collective historical memory as a people. Once I wrote a paper called um, From the Crocodile's Belly, They Shall Rise Again, The Insurrection, Resurrection, and the Afterlives of the Babaylan as both hermeneutical method and metaphor for telling the stories and the struggles of LGBT persons and LGBT persons of faith in the Philippines. So that's um, a painting that my friend who was beaten by the police earlier uh, made for me. So that's supposed to uh, be a babaylan, a shaman, priestess, rising from the belly of the crocodile. Our pre-colonial societies, to varying degrees, recognize the leadership of three individuals or council of individuals. The Datu, or the village chieftain, the Pandai, or the village blacksmith or craftsman, and the Babaylan, or the Bailan, the village spiritual leader or priestess. She is also the midwife and the healer for the village. I invoke the Babaylan in this presentation as a means to unpack uh, turning swords into plowshares because the Babaylan's executions, as recorded, were pivotal to the success of the imperial project of Christianization of our archipelago. The surest way for the colonizers to control the tribes was to kill off spiritualities and beliefs, and with it, the memory of our culture. Lenny Strobel describes in her writing how the Bailan, especially those who took up arms and fought back, were skewered and left to die slow deaths along the riverbanks to be eaten by crocodiles. And our crocodiles in the Middle and South Philippines are really, really huge. Um, getting eaten by one is uh, still possible to this day. Like if you get eaten whole, that's uh, still a possibility. And so the reference to the Bailan resurrecting from the crocodile's belly is a reference to these executions. And the Bailans who escaped capture and execution were forced to hide and disappear deep into our forests. And those Bailan who did not die by the sword or by the gun were killed by fake news. This, I believe, uh, is the fate of um, all pre-colonial shamans and spiritual leaders. The colonizers launched awful smear campaigns about them. And so in the decades following these executions, all of the horror stories told to children are about either the aswang, a mythical creature that climbs up and through thatched roofs and sucks out embryos from mother's umbilic umbilical cords, or the Manananggal, a beautiful enchantress that during a full moon hunts by splitting in half and her upper torso grows wings and that resemble the wings of fruit bats flying over forests and fields looking for cattle or children to eat. And the Mangkukulam or the Mambabarang, a bruja that can cast all sorts of spells. They demonize is the Babaylan in this way. These stories are being told to this day. As a child, I would spend my summer vacations in my mother's town in Sikihor. Now, Sikihor is a very curious island. It's a very small island with six towns. Um, and uh, that island uh, is called the Island of Fire and Witchcraft and Sorcery. Um, so, <laughs> and so um, the stories about the Aswangs and the Manananggals and the Brujas are, are still very alive there. The workers in my grandmother's house would tell stories, so uh, these stories to us, uh, to get me and my cousins to stop playing outside after sunset. The demonization of the brave, strong, and wise Babaylan ensured the colonizers' control over, spirit, of, over our spiritual narratives, our pre-contact spiritual narratives. The Babaylan imagery was then replaced. The Babaylan image was then replaced with the Christian versions of women saints and martyrs who were venerated for their humility and tolerance to torture and oppression and their total submission to the will of the Christian God. 
Carolyn Brewer in her article by Lan Asog, Transvestism and Sodomy, Gender Sexuality in the Sacred in Early Colonial Philippines, writes, in the Philippines, in the Philippine context at the beginning of the colonial endeavor, there is, moreover, another aspect to highlight regarding the thesis that the occupation of a neutral third sex gender space signals exceptional access to spiritual power. While there is no doubt while there is no doubt that most of the religious facilitation was performed by women, there is no evidence that women's sacred potency was in any way dependent upon the identification with a third sex or gender space. For example, female body, masculine behavior. Indeed, both female and male shamans for ritual purposes dressed in clothing that was identified as belonging to women. In the relative gender symmetry, prevalent throughout the archipelago at this time, the temporary or permanent male-feminine inversion of the bayog served a threefold purpose. It gave the male shaman status and authority in a sphere that would otherwise have been denied to him. It reinforced the stereotypical boundaries of femininity, but in doing so, it also importantly reinforced the normative situation of woman as shaman. Given this reality, it must be argued that spiritual potency was dependent and not, not on the identification with a neuter um, third uh, sex gender space, but rather on identification with the feminine, whether the biological sex was male or female. In pre-contact, pre-colonial histories, our shamans, largely a feminine space, as with all other pre-contact um, uh, divinities is largely a feminine space within and she further writes uh carolyn brewer further writes and i'll send you the article it's very interesting to read if you're ever interested <laughs> within european monotheistic societies the dualism inherent inherent in the male female dichotomy spills over to an unequal um gendered power relationship between men and women that Eileen Sixu. Um, illustrates as man over woman. However, in animist pre-colonial Southeast Asia, gendered categories were differently constituted within discrete cultural settings, which did not necessarily result in the advantage to the male uh, that uh, Sixu's model demonstrates. Indeed, in pre-contact animist Philippines, there was a bilateral kinship system Women actively participated in the economic realm and maintained control over their earnings. Virginity was not valued. Adultery was not noteworthy. Both women and men were chieftains, and women predominated the spiritual realm. As I said earlier, divinity, as in most pre-colonial, pre-contact indigenous societies around the world, while, all, while almost exclusively a feminine space, was not constrained by the biological concerns of the Hispano-Catholic and even later the American evangelical gays. And this is why our queer feminist theological art articulations, at least in our training here in Union, begin with the Bailan or the Babaylan. Our feminist theologies course here in, the, in, in U UTS is literally called Babaylan and feminisms, <laughs> invoking our resistances to Euro-American masculine monotheism. Theologies that privilege the fluidity of the divine and the vessels by which these divinities choose to speak, act, and proclaim. Theologies that resist the monopoly macho monotheism of Euro-American Christianity. These theologies that deconstruct and reconstruct theologies of myth-making and recovery of what was good and beautiful in our oldest historical memories, these theologies, my friends, are liberating. The third one. Oh my gosh, this is the last point. Turning swords into plowshares. The third point. Unerasing the disappeared in our Judeo-Christian texts. One of the most empowering visual images that I learned here in Union is the circle from Kuo Kui Lan. She invites people to imagine a circle and then to cut the circle into halves. One half represents men and the other half represents 
distance women. If one cuts the women's half into halves, half of that or one fourth of the whole circle represents the Asian woman. Yes, one out of four people on earth is an Asian woman. If one goes back to the male half, and cut that half into thirds, then one third of the men or one sixth of the world are white men. And less than 1% of that white male portion writes over 90% of the books of books that the whole world reads. My own experience of evangelical Christianity reflects that statistic. I grew up reading books or listening to sermons based on commentaries of white Euro-American evangelical straight macho men. And they will really rarely talk about women. They will never talk about queer people in our Judeo-Christian texts because they simply do not have the imagination for it. Um, sidebar, I come from a third generation Muslim converts to Christianity. My family uh, is, um, um, I hail from kind of like a warrior Moro tribe in the deep south of the Philippines. Uh, so uh, my, my Muslim tradition is the kind of Muslim tradition that did not read Arabic. So it was a uh, very, very conservative already as a Muslim tradition. Uh, my great grandfather had five wives um, the first wife I happened to be Christian, who was converted into Christianity, evangelical Christianity, the Christian Missionary Alliance, to be specific. And so all of us, uh, all of us uh, became Christian. All of her children um, and their grandchildren uh, became uh, evangelical Christian. Um, and that kind of dynamic. Uh, uh, informed uh, my uh, theology growing up, my Christology, my everything uh, growing up. I was a Bible quiz champion um, <laughs> at the national level. So uh, every day my parents would uh, do uh, family altars and family devotions. And, uh, but I had to leave, I had to leave CMA because I was born gay and I, um, and, uh, I could not continue in that church. And so MCC pretty much saved my life, I suppose. <laughs> okay, moving on. Lizette Pearl Tapia Raquel, who is my academic dean, uh, wrote her dissertation entitled The Assumption of Desire Toward a Feminist Theology of Incarnation. And she speaks about the assumption of desire as a counter discourse to the assumptions of femininity, essentialism, sexualization, and powerlessness. This assumption of female desire, eros, and love comes down, from, uh, comes down to us from the divine and is embodied in the flesh in Jesus Christ. She writes that first, the divinity of radical monotheism must become a multiplicity and the limited incarnation of Christ must become unlimited. In the discourse on divine multiplicity, all of humanity can now truly be created in the image of God and our experience experiences of divine revelation can be honored. In the discussion on unlimited incarnation, where the fullness of divinity of, of the divinity of Christ is also connected to his, to his full humanity in the flesh, and the body of all become the locus of incarnation. This means that female bodies can also be the site of incarnation and the revelatory of God. So then this assumption of desire is the inception of feminist incarnation. Furthermore, her work sought to exhibit that feminist incarnation and radical multiplicity have its genesis in the desire, eros, and love of God. Thus, the multiplicity of women's identity, sexuality, and agency is honored and held sacred. In the Philippine context, and possibly in many others, where feminist consciousness translates to collective movements, the embodiment of divinity through resistance, creativity, and liberation are already manifest. This is both a theological claim and a prophetic imperative. Elizabeth Schusler-Fiorenza, in um, her book, In Memory of Her, uh, 
it remains to be one of the most influential books in feminist interpretation, theological deconstruction and creative imagination, um, building on, uh, on the hermeneutics of suspicion. She reconstructs the beginnings of early Christianity by extrapolation, by filling the gaps with women's stories and voices that patriarchy, or Schuster Fiorenza uses kiriarchy, has silenced. The linchpin of her book is the story of the unnamed women, woman who anointed Jesus with oil in Mark 14.9, which reads, Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she had done will be told in memory of her. The church has forgotten her and many more like her. Musa Dubes, post-colonial feminist interpretation of the Bible, Thus, the remembering via the lens of Rahab. Reading the Bible from a decolonizing perspective, Dube proposes taking the perspective of the Canaanite Rahab to unpack the imperializing rhetoric of the text and its interpretation that continues to wreak havoc on present-day Canaanites, especially the most vulnerable. Dube interrupts biblical narratives by privileging stories, mostly stories of women, that are not traditionally told in ways that show how they intervene and disrupt. If and when these stories are included, they mostly function to complement some hegemonic agenda. As we know, many of these written stories are polyvalent. Since all uh, we truly have are fragments, reconstructed texts and contexts, Dubis propositions such as the extrapolated narrative about Judith and Rahab ultimately function to expose the way stories are reconstructed to serve a hegemonic imperial agenda and secondly reveal facets about these stories that would have been relegated as unimportant by the body or bodies refereeing the text. My own work in biblical studies and early Christian literature privileges the story of Salome or uh, I have a paper called Salve, Salome, Corpus, Myth, Canon, and the Quest for Salome. Um, it's set out to unerase Salome from texts that we call sacred, particularly from the Gospel of Mark, with at least three scenes involving Salome. Of course, I use extra canonical uh, writings uh, to reconstruct this. First, that she was a young woman who asked for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Second, that she was with Jesus in the garden with a young man who wore the linen cloth. Um, uh, this is on uh, the secret gospel of uh, Mark by Morton, Morton Smith. Um, third, she was with the other women at the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. My work is guided by the four source theory and applies the methodology of its historical Jesus research to track down the surviving accounts of Salome's life as a disciple of John the Baptist and of Jesus. From these accounts extracted from both canon and extra canonical gospels, the study extrapolates a Salome, or it extrapolates Salome's stories as a disciple and as a leader of the early Christian church. It also unveils how and why her story was systematically erased from biblical canon as we know it. This study is not only um, a study about Salome in the wider world of the, uh, it's not the only study about Salome in the wider um, world of biblical studies, nor is it the first piece of discourse to talk about her. However, it is uh, my hope that in this work, uh, all these pieces of discourse can come together to form kind of like a Salome collective or a Salome corpus, which people's diverse ideas can come together and birth new ways of imagining. And that uh, the discourse joins the many voices clamoring for Christianity to open its doors to interpretations of works deemed extra canonical and heretical. Salome is in fact the second most attested woman in antiquity next uh, second only to Mary of Magdalene. Um, and yet uh, Christian orthodoxy has erased her. Therefore, my third point as a means to unpack turning swords into plowshares, my third and last point, 
theologies that search for and privilege the stories of the disappeared in the Christian canon by employing methodologies and extrapolating stories that will make space for queer myth-making along the spaces between words in and these theologies that imagine beyond the orthodoxy and theology of the Kyriarchy, these theologies are liberating. And let me end with this, empires will rise and fall, but communities will endure. And that's a reminder to everyone, and I heard uh, someone say this in one of the uh, MCC sermons in a big gathering. Community, in fact, my friends, is our middle name. Thank you so much. Good evening. And thank you so much. Um, I have many notes here, um, as I'm sure I saw some others taking notes also. Um, we do wanna open up the floor to any questions. Um, passionate, prophetic, powerful, thank you, Kakai. Amen to that. Um, we do want to He's my Bible teacher. He's <laughs> my Bible teacher. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions, comments um, uh, for Professor Kakai? I so appreciated uh, the images of uh, the Jeep as a weapon of mass destruction and um, turning the Jeep into the Jeepney, particularly the, um, I heard in that story also uh, an economic shift, right? Uh, you know, uh, when you think of imperialism and, and the Jeep and economic power, and then uh, transforming that into uh, pay what you can, uh, we're going to share this uh, truly public transportation. So I'm th seeing uh, some other messages there. Any other images that struck uh, struck you, Elder Velma? Professor Kakai, I to practice shamanism. I mean, yes. you're. <laughs> it, it was just so amazing to learn this new term. By land and Baba land. By land, yes. Uh, by land. I said, uh, I had to look it up. I said, well, what does that mean? And, you know, so it's just, you know, chills down my bones and just connecting at the root level with me. I think, and I do have Native American ancestry and I do practice shamanism. So I, I'm just so grateful and, not, and I'm speechless. It was very powerful and definitely many good points in this. So I thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, Babaylan is B, yes, there, thank you. Um, and and uh, semiotics, let me just quickly unpack Babaylan. Is this, this can actually be just one whole presentation about the Babaylan. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, Madam Chair, if I can quickly respond to that comment. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, it, it's very exciting. And in the Philippines, uh, Bailans uh, are uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Sir Reeve, uh, Revelation, if uh, uh, you have to be 40 to become a Babaylan. Uh, it, it, the, the Babaylan ritual uh, in communities, uh, you have to wait until you're 40 uh, to be kind of like uh, 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 rich, uh, the community then uh, performs a ritual uh, to bless you. Um, the stories of the Babaylan exist to this very day. Um, and as I said earlier, by lands, while it is largely a feminine space, um, it does not require uh, a, a biological uh, uh, kind of uh, prerequisite. Uh, when you are by land, you just have to uh, perform uh, in the perform your femininity in public and perform these rituals um, to that effect. So, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm I'm so glad, and I hope we get to uh, talk more soon. Uh, thank you, Elder Velma. I certainly was experiencing a lot of Holy Spirit shivers as a Baba Babylon uh, was being uh, discussed. Um, 
have a question, sure. Elder Gaddy. Yeah. Sorry, my microphone wasn't working earlier. Uh, Kathy Alexander. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Kakai, for uh, all that you offered. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about the point of reclaiming stories and birthing our own myths. You talked about the uh, that for indigenous folks and people where you are. How can we um, authentically do that from our own locations, from where we are, so that we don't appropriate other people's stories and try to, to do that, reclaim other people's stories where we can reclaim our own stories where we are and not in a, a way that appropriates. Well, that's a very good question. Um, a question that I actually do not know the answer to. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, there are, um, yeah, that's that's kind of a, 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 I suppose it's a locus question, isn't it? Um, or maybe steps we can take, steps we can take to discover our own stories, a methodology maybe. Yes. Um, a good a good starting point, uh, of course, is to come face to face with um, the colonial ex uh, in, uh, experience. And uh, I do not uh, I don't want to use this word lightly, you know, uh, because it's a it's a very loaded word. Um, uh, but if you, uh, especially for instance, in your case, and we call that from uh, from 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 our side of the world, uh, you are pretty much in the belly of the beast uh, kind of and uh, the task of uh, the task of reclaiming and the task of insurrection um, theological insurrection uh, follows a very different uh, kind of framework uh, as as we would do it uh, for instance in 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 uh, spaces who uh, previously colonized uh, um, countries so I um, It's, uh, it's, it's, I, I don't want to romanticize uh, reaching back and um, bringing into memory our uh, a colonial, uh, a pre-colonial uh, historical collective memory. Um, but uh, all these uh, things, the recovery of stories, it's a task uh, that, 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 uh, that all peoples must, must, um, must perform, I suppose, and then we realize that the systems or the people that had been running the systems or the people that perpetuate a system of, of oppression and imperialism um, are, are not that many. Um, and they don't, uh, uh, and, and, and not all of them have names or faces. And, the, and then you suddenly realize that this, con this uh, Human human connection between uh, the oppressed and the oppressor uh, in that sense. Uh, this is very um, uh, this is very pedagogy of the oppressed <laughs> and that kind of um, uh, liberative and liberating uh, conversation uh, will eventually happen. Um, I uh, I have read a few books of Filipinos in diaspora or um, or. Um, uh, People of Robert Warrior, for instance, who who um, who wrote uh, beautifully, uh, and, and Sir Reeve and Revelation can speak more about this. But um, the the reclaiming of of space and homeland and the indigenous uh, people's experience, um, as well as, for instance, experience of uh, transatlantic slavery as as a result of um, uh, Christian imperial expansion. Um, Th that uh, it's, it's, it's so layered and much, much more hard, especially when you come from a super uh, superpower country such as the United States, for instance, or if you do ministry from there. Um, so I don't know how to answer the question, but I suppose a first good step, uh, a good first step is to come um, as honestly as possible uh, with with your vulnerabilities and um, your baggage, and just figure out uh, as you go. Uh, I I suppose that's the best answer I can give you. 
thank you thank you for for asking that question i see a question in the chat yes yep uh can you name again those uh extra canon canonical sources okay. for salome so for that paper i used um three uh let me just pull that paper up oh no wait so I used the gospel according to Thomas. Uh, wait. And now I'm pulling out my paper. Uh, so I used the gospel according to uh, Thomas. Um, this is, of course, uh, extra canonical. Um, and uh, hmm. Uh, of course, I used also uh, Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews uh, as, as a, a way to name Salome because in Mark, it was a footnote. Um, and <laughs> in, in, uh, in the, the, the story of John the Baptist, the beheading of John the Baptizer, uh, the girl there is not named. And uh, Salome uh, is mentioned as a footnote um, uh, citing uh, Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews. Um, I also use the resurrection of Jesus Christ according to Bartholomew the Apostle. This is a Coptic, uh, Coptic Greek gospel. I don't read Coptic Greek, but uh, I use that. <laughs> I use that as well. I relied on Google Translate and my uh, genius of a New Testament professor, uh, Revelation Dabunta, who is also in this call. Um, yeah, so, uh, and also, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the secret gospel of Mark. Um, which is uh, a short, uh, a short, um, uh, in, uh, a short quote embedded in a letter attributed to Clement of Alexandria and addressed to a, a man named Theodore. Uh, this material, although it is a highly um, controversial material, highly contested, um, it was recovered by Morrison, Morton Smith. Uh, of uh, Columbia, uh, professor of ancient history at Columbia. So those are the roughly the four sources that I use to kind of reconstruct and extrapolate an image of the Salome, who would then be, um, uh, I argue in this paper, um, uh, who is the sole witness uh, to uh, the to the. No, sorry. Uh, who is the who is one of the more important witness? I I suppose uh, that the messianic claimant John the Baptizer was not the Messiah uh, and did not resurrect because she held the uh, severed hand. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, the same woman, if I can, uh, uh, if my my extrapolation. Uh, works is uh, the, uh, the same uh, Salome who was present at the resurrection at the tomb of Jesus of Nazareth who found an empty tomb. So the paper pretty much um, um, extrapolates a Salome who danced in the, in the banquet of Herod um, and the same Salome who then became a disciple of Jesus who was also present at the tomb at the resurrection. So it's a uh, it's an ambitious project, but my panel did approve it. Uh, so, and I passed uh, the, 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 um, the defense. So I suppose that's a, a good enough paper, but the paper that I'm not ready to publish just yet. Uh, it needs a lot of work, a lot more work, uh, but, but thank you. Thank you, Carol, for, uh, for taking an interest. Uh, so uh, additionally, Salome, of course, is very scarce in in uh, in the Christian canon, um, but very very abundant. You know, her her name is uh, ha there's a book uh, entitled, and I just uh, found it after I turned in my paper. It's called the the Afterlives of of Salome, um, and she lives on in um, in in uh, uh, common culture, in pop culture, in in uh, in tradition, um, but not in our uh, canonical texts. Uh, many of her stories were uh, relegated uh, to the dustbins of uh, history. So 
the task of recovering, uh, much like the task of recovering stories about Mary of Magdalene, just to paint a fuller picture of who she is. Um, uh, it's the same kind of uh, quest, uh, I suppose. If I'm done with the paper, I will send it to you, Carol. I promise. I am Thank so you. full right now. I am I am so full, and I feel so much gratitude uh, for Professor Kakai uh, and for all of the other um, lecturers in this series. I uh, I am full of gratitude. We have reached our hour time. We have been trying to stick to that hour time uh, because we realize. Um, you know, uh, folks have, uh, speaking of full, folks have full schedules. And uh, this has been recorded um, and you can return to it again and again. And uh, for our colleagues who were not able to be here today, they can uh, certainly check out uh, the recording. Um, are there any last brief questions before we have uh, Elder Maxwell close us in prayer? Okay. Okay. Thank you again, Professor Kakai. Yeah, thank you. Will you pray with me? God of many names, how blessed we have been today. We thank you for the wisdom shared by Professor Kakai. We thank you for all who are here, the many voices in this space, and the voices who will continue to join us as the days go by. As we go from here, let us remember and be inspired by jeeps into jeepneys, mm -hmm. by the liberating stories that we may tell of our own cultures and traditions, and by remembering those who have been erased. Let those voices join us again Empires will rise and fall, but communities will endure. And we ask this blessing is with us as we go from here today. Amen. Amen.